Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. My name is Jenny Hornick, and I'm the Digital Marketing Coordinator here at JMIR Publications. And um, to welcome to today's webinar presented by JMIR Mental Health, the official journal of the Society of Digital Psychiatry. Today, our panel will be discussing supporting eating disorder treatment with AI and digital technology. So I'll get started and introduce Dr. John Torres. Dr. Torres is the director of the Digital Psychiatry Division in the Department of Psychiatry at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, an affiliated teaching hospital of Harvard Medical School. He's also the editor-in-chief of JMIR Mental Health. So I'll pass things off to you, John, to kick things off. Excellent. Thank you to JMIR and the Society for Digital Psychiatry hosting this. We have a lot to cover. We have two fantastic speakers calling in. So we have Dr. Gemma Sharp, for Associate Professor in the Department of Neuroscience at Monash Data Futures Institute at Monash University in Australia. So I'll let you guess what time it could be for her, given it's about noon here in the East Coast of Boston. And we have Sarah Marini, who's the Operations and Communications Coordinator at the National Eating Disorder Information Center, NEDIC, in Toronto, Canada, so slightly north of here. So we have so much to cover because eating disorders is such an important topic. Chatbots and AI are such a hot topic. This is an amazing combination. You two have done some fantastic work. I want to start out with, with a question for you, Dr. Sharp. You recently wrote a piece called The Most Common Eating Disorder that no one has ever heard of. So perhaps you could tell us what is the most common eating disorder no one has ever heard of, and that may get us started on the topic. Thanks so much, John. And thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Jenny. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here today, even though it is a bit of a weird time here in Melbourne. And thanks for the question there, John. What a, what a hyped up title that is. Um, so the answer was actually binge eating disorder. So most people have heard of anorexia and bulimia, but um, binge eating disorder is actually more common. And uh, we just wanted to really shine a light on that, that a lot of people um, may not even realize they're experiencing an eating disorder because they're not engaging in any compensatory behaviors like um, vomiting or uh, excessive exercise, that kind of thing, um, or restriction. So uh, we really wanted to encourage people to seek support if their relationship with their bodies and food was um, was going a bit uh, skew-whiffed. And we had a really strong response to that. And and um, we encourage people to chat with their health professionals more and more about their eating habits. That That is one I think that most people wouldn't consider as the most uh, prevalent common. And we'll come back to different treatments and options for it. But Sarah, to introduce what you do, can you tell us about what is the National Eating Disorder Information Center and what is your role in it there? Thanks, uh, John and Gemma and everyone for being here. So the National Eating Disorder Information Center, NEDIC, is a unique program of the University Health Network Center for Mental Health in Canada. Um, and we provide eating disorder information, support, resources, and referrals. We really have two branches to our work. So our outreach and education team facilitates workshops, presentations, and webinars to varying, varying audiences. And NEDIC also creates and disseminates informational resources and provides support to people impacted by eating disorders and disordered eating through our toll-free helpline and live chat um, seven days a week, where we offer in-the-moment support and help in navigating pathways to care. Um, and at NEDIC, as, uh, my role is uh, operations and communications coordinator. So I do a few things, but I've been very involved in this project with Gemma specifically. So you and Netta clearly stay busy then if you're that's it's a lot of work for for a very We're challenging pretty... illness to treat in, in a vast area of all of Canada but let's maybe now quickly jump in and talk about chatbots and I think we were saying before there's actually a whole family of chatbots you're going to introduce us to but let's talk about maybe just the background of why do chatbots make sense here and then the first player kit of the chatbots we'll talk about 
Uh, thanks, John, for the question. And yes, so why why use chatbots in eating disorders? And I suppose in, in my home country of Australia, and this is also the case around the world, there weren't enough clinicians for the, the scope of the problem of eating disorders in Australia. And we thought, well, we can't suddenly create a, a bunch more people, a bunch more health professionals quickly. So we thought, how could we potentially help um, help people with a, a digital solution and uh, chatbots were a bit more in their infancy when we first started with kit um, so that was sort of 2019 2020 and if we cast our minds back that coincides with the COVID-19 pandemic doesn't it so we we had the idea of kit before COVID-19 pandemic but while we were developing it the pandemic started in earnest and that really accelerated our development of KIT much faster than I think if we weren't experiencing those conditions. And I think KIT was really designed as a more kind of prevention education chatbot and uh, ended up sitting on our national helpline page, um, Butterfly, for um, people who don't know the Australian organisation. And um, it helped shoulder their helpline service during the pandemic uh, because it was so oversubscribed and just um, people really wanted to get help more quickly and KIT uh, served that purpose. And I'm going to put a link in the chat. There's several papers on KIT. But this is one of several that you, you've done with it as a chatbot. But I, I think now there's a new chatbot, so number two, called Gem, perhaps named after you. Gem, that's a J, not a, a G. I know. But... Do you know what? I didn't want people to call me a narcissist, John. So I the J there. And it's, so they have a slight doubt. Um, but yeah, it was named <laughs> after me. Um, doesn't look like me, though. Like I like to think. Oh, I've got my glasses. I know we've, uh -oh. we've made, modeled the glasses on me. Um, and yeah, Gem was the next step up from Kit. Um, so Kit was very basic, like just um, very button driven, classic rule based chatbot, which Gem still is as well. But Gem has, a, I suppose, a little bit more AI, a little bit more understanding. And also, I think um, through our collaboration with Netic has uh, has really expanded its um, international appeal and being able to help more um, culturally and linguistically diverse groups. And what would you say the, the focus of GEM is, given well, chatbots can do so many things? Yeah, and I think GEM has still maintained its eating disorder prevention, educational focus and, and supporting a helpline. Um, so GEM has never lost those kinds of features, but has, um, I suppose, refined its content, better conversations, um, still has those micro skills as well for people who are just looking for some quick um, relief. So mindfulness, CBT, uh, those kinds of skills are still in there too. And then there may be a third chatbot that builds off these. <laughs> Yeah, thank thank you, John. And I'll pr I promise to be quick because I know it's sort of you know getting into people's memories. Uh, just our one that's currently in randomized control trial that should be done by the end of twenty twenty four. That's uh, for people on wait lists, and that's called EDSE, and that stands for Eating Disorder Electronic Single Session Intervention. Okay. So it's the next step up. Like it's not sort of general use. It's not sort of helping a helpline. It's literally for people who've signed up for treatment and are waiting those weeks, day, weeks, months to actually see a health professional. Which is a terrific use case. I'll just say from Boston, when we are referring people with eating disorders for treatment, we have a lot of mental health services in Boston, Massachusetts. We're a rather fortunate city, but there's still a very long list for people with eating disorders. So that's definitely a niche that needs to be filled. Thank you, John. We'll be hitting up Boston next. Um, it's currently in trial in Australia and the results are looking great, but we would love to expand. Yeah. So maybe just we can comment We'll, we'll jump into AI in a second, but you, again, even before COVID, we're working on this first chatbot kit. It moved into GEM. Now there's a specialized one creep on a wait list. As researchers and innovators working a bit, how do you kind of nimbly keep, how do you make those moves and keep changing of technology? 
Um, great question, John. And I think, I suppose it's, um, you know, attending events like this, going to conferences, uh, making sure that we're up to date with all the literature, uh, both from a research and technology perspective. And and obviously now we have um, our large language models kicking about, which we have been using for other tools only internally at this stage. So like quite sort of small scale testing. Um, but uh, yes, it is is definitely a challenge to to keep up. So I think if anyone in the audience is feeling the same, it yeah, it for for us who have been doing it for years, it's still a challenge. Yeah. I mean, this technology does not stay static at all. And especially as you said, yeah. Kit kind of began as a rule-based chatbot. We, we've all now heard of, of course, ChatGPT and other AI chatbots. How, how do you both actually see AI kind of entering into this space? This, do you want me to go first, Sarah, or would you like to? Sarah, go ahead. Okay. Um, I mean, we're, we're already already doing it, John, with our, um, our, I suppose, our language models, which we've been able to develop because of all the work we've already done. So we know that what we're providing is evidence-based. So I think we we know it can be done well and, and safely because of the earlier work that we've done. I think if someone's sort of just jumping into it now, they might potentially um, uh, might not necessarily have all the background to to do it well, but I'm really glad that we have chat GPT because I think it's serving a fantastic function, maybe not providing eating disorder care, but um, it's certainly um, doing great things in other areas. Yeah, I think it would be fair to say that we've moved pretty slowly, but there are some really interesting applications of AI right now. As Gemma's noted, um, Gemma is a rule-based chatbot, so it has very, it does, it is AI, but it has um, very specific ways that it uses that, which works for our purposes, which is connecting people to specific information. And that's part of the reason we've moved slowly, because we know that our clients tend to be people who are maybe in the earlier stages of recovery or trying to learn more to support someone else. So they want reputable information, but we need to be a little careful in the way we deliver it. So for that reason, I think that's where we've ended up with Jim. I, I think that makes sense. And I mean, for any of us who have tried ChatGPT, it does say at the beginning, please do not use me for medical advice, right? Just because mm -hmm. you can ask it something doesn't mean that you should ask it or you should trust it. And one thing I've noticed is a lot of these, even ChatGPT, it's a lot of it's trained on social media. And social media is very good for some things, right? But I don't know if you want to go to it for treatment support. If you pull up Reddit or your favorite social media, there's advantages, but it's probably not. It's hard if that that's where a lot of the data is coming from. And I suppose that brings up the ethical issues, which we can't get away with. And, and I know, Gemma, you and I wrote a brief paper on this in 2023. I'll put it in the chat as well. But maybe you could just talk about the, the ethical issues and I, I think you guys have a pretty advanced framework for this having done this for a long time um thanks so much John and yeah that was a whole year ago that that was published I really appreciate you prompting me to reflect on that and I I think it still holds true like of course I'm a bit biased right it's our own paper um but really I think what I noticed when I reflected on that paper was that the, the co-design, the multidisciplinary co-design is now very much the norm. I think when we were first starting this out in, in digital health, um, it was basically researchers and techies who were, were making everything. Um, but now it, it really is lived experience. We do have ethicists on our team as well as our software developers. So whenever a problem arises, it's also a multidisciplinary solution as well as par for the course. So I think it's really improved our research and hopefully other people's who've, who've read the paper or, or are adopting a similar approach. It's, it's such a new space and the technology does keep evolving. It really does take building that team. And I think those of us listening know too, it's hard to build those teams. It's hard to maintain those teams to keep it it running well. It's it's a lot of work that you guys have done to even 
be able to present it and share it at, at this stage. And one piece, this is, we've had prior podcasts and most of us have always seen research on apps and wearables. And we just know in the digital mental health space that attrition has been labeled by some people as the Achilles heel, right? You can you can download the app, you, you can get the program, you can talk to the chatbot, but like, do people keep using it? And as you said, for the eating disorder, there's a wait list, there's a use case. Maybe, uh -oh, did I freeze? Sorry, I froze for a second. For, for, for some use cases, you don't need sustained engagement forever. But generally, engagement has been kind of called the Achilles heel. And you published another paper, you published many papers, but this one kind of talked about... Can I say engagement. not as many as you, John, though? But uh, <laughs> thank you for the heads up. Yeah. <laughs> So what do we know about engagement in these? Like, do people stick with them or is it just a shiny object people want to see today and then they drop it? I think it's all of the above. And I, I really shout out to um, my colleagues, Arma Jabir and Lorraine Chudakar from Singapore for that wonderful paper that's just gone through the chat. And it was an absolute honor to be part of that systematic review and meta-analysis where we found that attrition rates were about 20%. Um, for for chatbots and um, uh, there was a little bit of a difference uh, between short and long engagement um, but I think I feel like it's not too much of a surprise because like if we think of how we've evolved as humans we're very social creatures and so we find that if it's a blended model, so there's some kind of human interaction involved in it, maybe there's still a lot of chatbot as well people do tend to stick with it. And I, I feel like it's because we want to, generally speaking, if we're going to a chatbot in a mental health situation, we want to feel cared for. And a chatbot can't necessarily do that on its own. But if it's a human plus a chatbot supplementation, that can be a really effective model. And that's what I use clinically well. So people are still sort of seeing me for sessions and the chatbot is kind of supplementing skill work outside of sessions. So I think, um, and, and something else we found in that uh, review was that if the chatbot had like a a character or an avatar, it um it kept people in as well. So it shows that even trying to sort of simulate a human type um personality for a chatbot was helpful for engagement. Sometimes I joke to my patients, there's a penguin chatbot, there's a robot chatbot. I'm like, which one do you like more? <laughs> That's not a very good way to pick one. I do not recommend that, but it is okay. The penguin sounds good, though. I would choose that. <laughs> it maybe we'll open up for questions soon so people can begin to put them in the chat. But maybe, Sarah, we'll start with you on this question. Clearly, you're helping a whole population. You're, you're managing a lot of need coming in. We, we have people like Gemma building these exciting chat boss. You're, you're working together. Where does this field go next in terms of chatbots, but e e eating disorder and, and AI. And we're, we're not asking you to predict the future. We know it's not possible, but where does this begin to, to, to move us? Because it's got to be somewhere different than we are today, where it's so hard to access any services. I think for us, that's part of what we're hoping to understand through using GEM to get some really good information about what people want and the ways they want to access it. And um, I think there are many reasons that people in the eating disorder space have been cautious of digital interventions and will continue to do so, which is part of why we've always viewed GEM as sort of complementary. It connects to our helpline um, so that individuals can answer, you know, GEM isn't designed to an answer every single question, so uh, they can connect to the helpline quite easily. And I think there's a lot of potential for that kind of augmentation, you know, most of the eating disorder um, national organizations like NEDIC are not 24 seven. Many have had to cut their hours recently. And in the absence of 24 seven services, we do what we can. And this is another avenue. Yeah. Gemma, any predictions for the future, Gemma? We won't hold you to it, don't worry. <laughs> Because I, I want to retire, John, so I'm hoping for a <laughs> replacement for myself. Um, I, you know, it, it is interesting, isn't it? I think 
I honestly think the human element will always be there because that's a far longer time in evolution than and than AI. I think it will always be used to to supplement um, other in person type services. But we do know that there are some people who really prefer that kind of step back. So I think it it will hopefully be that kind of personalized medicine model that people can choose what they want. Do they want like a purely chatbot experience? Do they want blend? do they just want human and and we would be able to predict what they would respond to best so that's my prediction that we can tailor it more to the person that that makes a lot of sense too and maybe we'll open up to some questions and this is this is a interesting question it says while chat gpt does give a warning notice about using not using conversation for medical purposes it's kind of tempting to ask it these questions right it doesn't stop you from doing it how can kind of we as both kind of academics researchers clinicians how do we address that do we need to train the models to kind of refuse to answer questions or do we need to kind of make the models better it, it's it's there's such a tempting thing that you can ask it these questions uh, and of course, we've all been there, haven't we, John? I've done it. Um, I remember when it first was released, I was asking a lot of these questions to see like its capacity. And I think we absolutely have been doing that negative training that the questioner has has spoken about because we know that, say, people with eating disorders may try and ask for weight loss tips, dieting tips, which we know is kind of counterintuitive to their recovery. So you can do that negative training and that's what I hope chat GPT would be, would be doing, particularly if it's sensing that the person has an eating disorder, that, um, that, that those unhelpful responses can be um, identified and, and, um, and delivered. So I, I'm sure we're, we're on the road to doing that. Yeah, that makes sense. And this is a question maybe more for Sarah or, or both of you, but it says, what job do we kind of have as educators, clinicians, advocates to help the public understand what these tools are here? I think we had a very conversation. We said, well, this is supplementing, this is augmenting, but how do we help people who aren't experts on these tools know their limitations? I think that's a really interesting question. And we've already seen some sort of pathways to this in social media, where if you're searching for eating disorder related terms, you'll get connected to helplines in your area. And I think that's going to remain important. Um, yeah. It's hard to educate users, especially sort of in the moment. And I think connecting them to resources where they can get that very specific nuanced information will be important. Yeah, that, that makes sense, at least to show people good quality information up front before you go down this rabbit <laughs> hole of it. Another question, many compliments on the presentation, also saying, what place do you see generative AI or li large language models as having a future tech landscape of eating sort of chatbots? They seem to be a disruptive new power that gets closer to the human plus chatbot solution, but there have been controversies encouraging people to diet. Do you think we can make them safe is basically what this is getting to? I do think so. Maybe I'm overly optimistic. I, I do appreciate that. And I think it is with all of that negative training. So I, we've done this with, uh, sorry to add to another another chatbot to the family, John, that's not currently out there, but um, particularly parents and carers of people with eating disorders, we've done that negative training with them and sort of gone any sort of uh, weight related question has sort of been pushed back on going, that's not my role. My role is to assist you with connecting you and your child to, to care. So we've done it in kind of a a smaller scale. So I do think it's possible. Um, I, I mean, a chatbot's only as good as the training it's received. So if it has learned all the, the good uh, news about dieting that we would normally give in eating disorder care, then then it, it stands a chance at least. It's, it's definitely hard to guarantee it'll ever be perfectly safe. Just like you can always go on the internet and find bad information too, if you search it exactly. out as, as well. Yes. This is an interesting question. It says, are there any plans to integrate digitized versions of theoretical interventions for AI-based chatbots addressing e-disorders such as mindful eating awareness intervention, mindfulness? 
That's a great question. I am potentially there is, and I'm not aware of it. Um, but but why not? I mean, we've seen the, I suppose, mindfulness in micro skill form in digital interventions for quite some time in eating disorders with good effect. So why couldn't it potentially be um, investigated and trialed? Yeah, the questions keep coming. This is good. So I'm going to keep you guys Great. busy. At this. Yeah, Can thank you, everyone. Kit or Jen diagnose the eating disorder or do they support symptoms and prodromal symptoms plus i wonder if they can prevent or be helpful for other disorders like depression yeah that's so kid and gem are not diagnostic um our waitlist chatbot has a little bit more capability there um but it is definitely sort of yeah that early intervention and connecting more with formalized support it's it's not really carrying a load of um of early treatment at all and I, i'm not aware of any chatbots that really do do extensive early treatment i think particularly because that's so crucial in an eating disorder trajectory um, to get good support early on. So I wouldn't necessarily rely on a chatbot. And the question also had, would it support other uh, issues yeah. like anxiety, depression, 100%, because we know that they're kind of precursors to eating disorder onset. So a lot of our skill work uh, covers uh, those areas as well. Yeah, that makes sense. This question is thanking you, Sarah, for answering your prior question, saying to follow up on the educating users questions, do you think we can make it part of the clinical workflow for providers or call center people to, to bring up about chat? Like, is there a way to kind of bring this into routine workflow, say, for people at your center? Or is that is it too early and we're not there yet? I think there are some specific instances where that would be useful. And I think part of that is um, Canada is a very big country and it treatment tends to be centered in a few very specific locations. So especially for people who are outside of those um, areas, it can be hard to find appropriate care. And that's not to say that this will provide care because that's beyond the scope of what we're trying to do. But I think providing another avenue to find reputable information, which is relevant to the person's situation, will be um, that will be something that we hope providers will um, want for people. I, I think you know, it's Gem is not a one one stop shop, which is true. I think of most of the chatbots out there. So we want to make sure that providers understand which specific instances it'll be useful for, so they can make that recommendation. That makes sense, and I think maybe two more questions. This is a there is no answer to this one, so I'll preface this, but what clinical framework or standards do you think should be mandatory for chatbots to follow? And I'll just add, if we don't have it, do we need to make that standard or should we just let the free market figure it out? <laughs> As, uh, you know, the, the latter does sound interesting, doesn't it, John? And maybe we've sort of seen a bit of that, um, but I just, I suppose, because we've been with these highly constrained chatbots that have been rule-based, we've applied the same standard that we would with our in-person clinical services. And that's kind of how I approach everything. Like, uh, would would I say this to a client? And so that I suppose that's why generative AI is more of a risk because it is generating its own responses. But um, yeah, I, I do think there do need to be standards just like for our in-person practice. Yeah. I think that's a wise one though to say, if, if we don't have great standards today, would it be something that would be acceptable for a human to do? And if not, it's probably risky and we'll figure out what to do, but we, we've seen bad things happen with chatbots in this space. So I think being a little bit cautious and trying to do no harm makes a lot of sense for, for what this is. I'm going to do one last question that I promise we'll, we'll end right on time. But it's, it's such an interesting one. So it says, following up on your point about anxiety and depression support as being relevant for eating disorders, do you think at some point in the future that we'll kind of have a consolidation of these chapters? bots or kind of a few bots of, is, is there a bot to rule them all to be nerdy or or do we need to have very specific disorders and well-trained do you know 
I, I feel like I have two answers to that. Like I would love there to be like this one-stop shop bot that could manage anything. But I think with just the way like the research landscape is designed, we all want our slice of the pie. So we're all going to be, I think, still doing our own thing. Um, so I predict probably still um, segmented, but um, I suppose it would be great if there was a, a chatbot that could handle a lot of different diagnoses and situations, and that would be fantastic. I think we may be out of time, but I'll for anyone who wants to reach you, Gemma or Sarah, in in the papers we share in the links, unfortunately, your contact information is there. So people will be able to find you directly. Oh, no. It, as, I hope they do the, fill my inbox. Please do. Yeah. So as so, it, it's possible to reach out because clearly this is an important topic. It's a vast topic. It's a topic that I would say changes every six months. We, we could redo this and we'll have a whole new conversation. So I think I appreciate you sharing the insights of where we are now and that you've taken it so far from pre-COVID rule-based chatbots is very innovative program. So thank you both so much. And I think we look forward to reading and hearing about the next step in this growing family of chatbots. So thank you everyone. And thank you for listening. Bye.